After you formulate your research question, examine various sources of information, and write your paper, the final product should be uniquely yours. If you decide to use the ideas, to paraphrase, or to use the exact words of an author, you have to give that person credit. If you do not give the author appropriate credit, you are guilty of plagiarism. In this module, you will learn how to responsibly incorporate information into your academic writing. Take a moment to review the Capital Community College Student Handbook section on expectations for student conduct. Using someone else's ideas or phrasing, and representing those ideas as your own, either on purpose or through carelessness, is a serious offense known as plagiarism. Others' ideas can mean the following. Proper citations are needed to avoid plagiarism. When you cite or give credit to an author for their words or ideas, you are creating a citation. There are strict guidelines for creating citations and a number of different citation styles that are used depending on what subject area you are writing for. Here are some of the most common citation styles and their respective subject areas. It is important to check with each of your professors to determine which citation style they want you to use. The remainder of this tutorial will discuss MLA guidelines. MLA, an abbreviation for the Modern Language Association, is the style most commonly used in the humanities. To begin, there are two types of citations. In-text citations, which appear in the body of your paper, and works cited entries, which appear at the end of your paper. You ask, why is it necessary to have both? In-text citations follow quotations or paraphrased information. Since they appear in the body of your paper, we want to avoid them taking up too much space, which would distract your reader. In-text citations only identify the author's last name and page number. But imagine if your professor attempted to locate your source and only had access to this information. It would be impossible. This is why MLA also requires works cited entries. A works cited entry provides all of a source's publication information, including the author, title, and publisher details, including the copyright date. And remember, for every works cited entry you list, you need to make sure you have a corresponding in-text citation or citations. There are two ways to convert information from your sources to your paper. You may paraphrase the information by putting it in your own words, or you may quote the information directly, keeping the author's exact wording. In both cases, you must include a citation that tells the reader where the information came from. Next, we will demonstrate how to avoid plagiarism by properly quoting. On the screen is a section taken from a magazine article. The article title, When to Hang Up the Car Keys, was written by Christina Corcoran and published in the magazine Psychology Today. When you want to include an author's exact words within a sentence, you may name the author in a signal phrase. Some signal phrases are, as so-and-so states, and according to so-and-so. 
At the end of an in-text citation using a signal phrase identifying the author's name, a citation is needed providing the page number in parentheses. When a signal phrase is not used and the author's name is not introduced, both the author's last name and page number must be included in the citation. When paraphrasing, you may not copy any sections word for word or borrow too much language from the original source. The following examples illustrate improper and proper paraphrasing. Again, using Corcoran's article, When to Hang Up the Car Keys, I identified a section that I believe would support my thesis. I want to avoid using too many direct quotations, so I will paraphrase the section. The original wording reads as follows. Seniors who are experiencing cognitive or physical decline shouldn't be the ones to judge their own driving abilities. Here is my first attempt at paraphrasing. Christina Corcoran says that senior citizens should not be determining their own driving abilities, especially when they are experiencing mental and physical decline. The highlighted words and phrases show the language that is plagiarized. The structure of the sentence also mirrors the original source to a large degree. So although I cite the author in a signal phrase, this example would still constitute plagiarism. Now take a moment to read my second attempt at paraphrasing Christina's argument. I identify the author using a signal phrase and provide a citation at the end of the sentence identifying the corresponding page number. The sentence structure and language no longer mirror the original source, but yet the sentence conveys the same idea presented in Christina's article. Now that you have a better understanding of in-text citations, let's examine work cited entries. For each source you identify in the body of your paper, MLA also requires you to provide a corresponding work cited entry. These citations are lengthier because you identify all of the publication information that a reader or your professor would need to locate the same source without further assistance. Our first example will demonstrate how to create a works cited entry for a book. Using the library catalog, let's locate the record for the book titled Noah Webster, Schoolmaster to America. The library catalog record identifies all of the publication information needed to complete a works cited entry for this source. Let's examine the record and identify the information needed. First, there is the author's name. Secondly, the title of the book. Next, you will need to identify the book's publisher and place of publication. And finally, the copyright date. Now that we have identified the relevant fields using the catalog record, let's create a works cited page in Microsoft Word. Begin your works cited on a separate page at the end of your paper. The works cited page will be formatted much like the body of your paper, including one inch margins, Times New Roman size 12 font, and double spacing between the lines. Begin by labeling the page Works Cited. This heading needs to be centered at the top of the page with no special formatting. 
The first citation will begin at the one inch margin. Watch as I type out the first citation. Now, let's discuss the process. You begin by identifying the author's last name, comma, author's first name, and middle initial, followed by a period. Secondly, we identify the title of the source. The title of the source is always italicized. Following the book's title, there is a period, then the book's place of publication, a colon, and the book's publisher. Next, you identify the book's copyright date. And lastly, the word print. This signifies the book's format. It is a print book rather than an electronic or web-based source. Indent the second and all subsequent lines of the citation an additional five spaces. This is called a hanging indentation and allows for your reader to easily identify where one citation ends and the next begins. Our second works cited entry will be for a magazine article retrieved using the library database Academic Search Premier. Here is the article's publication information. There are a few differences between a magazine citation and a book citation. One obvious difference is that the magazine citation will need to include two titles, the title of the article and the title of the magazine. Because magazines are published multiple times throughout the year, you will also need to identify a more specific publication date than simply the year. A third major difference is that the magazine article was retrieved electronically, so you must identify where you accessed it. In this case, the article was retrieved through the library database Academic Search Premier. Let's see how the citation looks when we take the information from the Academic Search Premier record and convert it into our works cited entry. Now let's discuss the process. Again, you begin with the author's last name, comma, author's first name, followed by a period. The title of the magazine article appears next. This title is surrounded by quotation marks and it is followed by a period. After the title of the article is the title of the source, in this case, the magazine Psychology Today. The title of the source is italicized just as we italicized the title of the book in the previous example. Following the title of the source, we identify the specific publication date. This magazine is published bi-monthly, so we need to identify both months using their abbreviations. After the publication date is a colon, followed by the page number or page range of the article. Next, we identify the name of the database where we retrieved the article. The name of the database is also italicized because it is acting as a source. The medium of the source, and lastly, the date you personally access the article. Notice how the day comes before the month. Finally, here is our works cited page. Our citations are double spaced with a hanging indentation. Remember that your entries need to be alphabetized by the author's last name.
Notice that the magazine article comes before the book because C comes before W in the alphabet. Just as the rest of your paper, the Works Cited page also requires a header. The header required by MLA includes your last name and the page number. To add a header, go to the Insert tab and select Page Number, Top of Page, Option Number 3. The page number automatically appears and then allows for you to manually type in your last name. Remember that this header also needs to be in Times New Roman size 12 font.